Hello, and welcome to my channel. My name is Jonathan Cohn, and today I have my book review of the book The Dragonbone Chair by Tad Williams. This is the first book in the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy. It includes books one, The Dragonbone Chair, book two, Stone of Farewell, and the incomparably massive book To Green Angel Tower. And uh, so I just read book one for the first time, and uh, I picked it up because of the recommendations of two booktubers I follow, Captured in Words with Jay Kennedy, and also uh, Brian Lee Durfee's booktube channel. And after picking up the book and reading it, I know exactly why both of them liked this book, because this book is so much flowery prose. If you enjoy that kind of name of the wind kind of flowery prose that's so so focused in your books, I'm sure you will love this book. I'll tip my hand and say I enjoyed the book, but I had many problems with it, but I overall did enjoy the experience. So the first thing I'll discuss is the tropes. This book handles a lot of traditional fantasy tropes. If you know anything about the fantasy genre, you will feel quite at home reading this book. A lot of the stuff that happens here just makes sense in the way a fantasy story would unfold. There, uh, a lot of the tropes about the young protagonist are very much followed. The, the hero's journey, the quest format is very much followed. Some damsel in distress types format is followed. There's a lot of traditional fantasy tropes that are utilized. However, uh, there's also one trope that is very much flipped on its head regarding the dynamic between the brothers jo uh, Joshua and Elias, the sons of King John, Prester John. And... I really liked the way he subverted that. Because every other trope followed nearly perfectly in line, when he subverted their trope, I, I didn't see it coming at all, and so it worked. Because he had set the groundwork of establishing everything else, when he pulled a fast one, it, it, I wasn't expecting it. That's how you do a good subversion, in my opinion, is when you do everything else the way you'd expect, and then pull the rug out automatically. And... So I really like the subversion of that trope. And really, I loved the whole political subplot of the... Well, not subplot, main plot of this book um, regarding Elias and Joshua. That was a really well-written, excellent part of the book. And I'll go more into it in just a second. Uh, where this book stumbles is, however, the, the, the differences between the first half of the book and the second half. The first half of the book is so slow. It's setting up the world. It's setting up where the book series is going. It's establishing the characters and it's establishing the, the, the world building and the magic system and the history and all that stuff. That can work really well in some books. However, because so little is happening in this first 300 pages, it's so boring to read. But when you get to the second half of the book, the second 300 pages, it is massively faster and more entertaining and bigger and more epic in scope and feels like, all right, things are happening. This is, this is when I'm ready. And it does have a very strong just like cut at the end and you're like, ah, oh, I need to know what happens. That was, I think he did a good job with that because it merely makes the reader want to continue on to the next book. Um, but I think that the first half of this book probably turns off a massive amount of readers. And I think the second half of this book really keeps the readership going. Anyone who makes it to the second half of the book probably is going to continue on with the series, but they have to get through that first half because it's really rough. Um, and I like world building and establishing and taking your time. I'm fine with that, but you need to give me a reason to keep reading. And the flowery prose just isn't enough. You know, part of another part of the issue is that the first half of the book is very much... Um, uh, like one character. It's very much just Simon, the main character. Simon's a great character. He works really well as your traditional fantasy male protagonist. They're very much the traditional hero. You know, he's not treated well by others, but he's a good guy. He's not particularly religious, but he's still a good guy and you really much respect him. So he's established well, but since he's the only point of view character and nothing's really happening, his character development's so slow 
things are mostly happening to him, not by him, that you feel frustrated. The second half of the book is very much a multi-character story. There are multiple characters. The princess is a main, is a main character. Josiah, not Josiah, Joshua is a main character. Elias is a main character. Um, uh, Isgrimner is a main character. Uh, Binabic, really fun character. Uh, I really like Binabic. And so you have all of these major characters and things are happening and you're jumping, cutting from one to another to another. And it works so well. The first half feels more like one of those single character stories like Name of the Wind or I'm trying to think of a comparable type of story um, to discuss. Whereas the second half really feels like a Wheel of Time novel. And I think that's why it worked for me is I love the Wheel of Time style uh, more. And there's still a lot of flowery language in the second half of the book, but because so much character development and so much plot is happening, I was okay with the flowery language. So there's a balance that you can do, and it's it all comes down to how you write the characters in the plot. And so... Uh, the book obviously has a lot of connections to The Lord of the Rings. The middle portion, I'd say the middle 200 pages of this book, really felt like uh, uh, just the storyline of getting to Rivendell and then having the, the Council of Elrond. Uh, the middle portion really matches the Fellowship of the Ring. But, and, and the rest of the book's tropes come from different eras of fantasy and The Lord of the Rings, but that's the most blatant, I thought, most blatant part uh, that was that I felt I could see him drawing influence, which I like that kind of thing, but I know some people don't. Uh, there is a certain bait and switch with a certain female character midway through the book that I didn't see coming, but as soon as it happened, the page that it happened, I was like, that makes absolute total sense. Can't believe I missed it. But it, 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 I, thought, I thought that uh, worked well. I do want to give a second to discuss the cover art. I think that this is br absolutely brilliant cover art by Tad Williams. My book, unfortunately, that's that oh, cover art was by Michael Whalen, I should say, uh, for the book by Tad Williams. I, my book got damaged. Um, I had it. It was a clean, pristine copy. And then it was in my car, and I set down uh, something that I thought was safe, and that something burst and got over the book, all over the book, and it ruined the book, and it was a sad day. But the book still is in fairly decent condition. It's still a nice cover. The cover is still beautiful. And the cover art for books two and three is also beautiful Michael Whalen cover art. There is a new style of art, which is basically just the swords from the trilogy. And I'm like, that's so boring. Why would you do that? Just swords is so boring on, on a book. Uh, give me a full pastel painting, something I could hang in my room. Uh, you know, I, I do like Michael Whalen's style. I still prefer... Uh, Dan Daryl K. Sweet style, but Michael Whalen is growing on me as a cover artist, and I thought the cover art here was good. I also thought that even though the t name, The Dragonbone Chair, is an excellent title for the book, it really is. It's an excellent title for any book to sound The Dragonbone Chair. It works, but it doesn't really work for this book. There's not much example of The Dragonbone Chair in this book. It is kind of... I, it's, it's, yes, it is used in the book, and, it, and the plot, the political plot has to do with who sits on the dragonbone chair, but it's not like a Game of Thrones where it, like, that title works for that book because it really is about that. Whereas this, it just kind of, it kind of works, but I think that maybe another book uh, title could have worked. I think that this book should have been called Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. Uh, I think that that would have been, you know, a more apt title. Or maybe just Thorn. That also could have been a very apt title. But still, it's a title that in and of itself it works, but when you put it with what actually happens in the book, it kind of doesn't work. So I had mixed feelings. Overall, I am positive. I think this is worth reading. But if you struggle with flowery prose, this may not be the book for you. But if you're willing to make it past the, about a th page 300, 350, you will really start enjoying as it picks up. Because that's about as soon as he gets to a certain city uh, that's very obvious when he gets there and he meets other characters, boy, does it pick up quite a lot. And it's quite enjoyable. So those are my thoughts on the Dragon Bone Chair. If you've read this, I gave it a 7 out of 10. Solid, but not amazing. Uh, and I will continue to read on, but because the flowery, heavy language, I think I'll give it a couple months before I read The Stone of Farewell. And I, boy... If the flowery language is still present in Green Angel Tower, I'm gonna, it's going to take me some time to read this one. Ooh, it's huge. So, 
If you've read The Dragon Bone Share, let me know your thoughts on the book down below. If you loved it, tell me that. If you struggled with it, let me know that as well. I'm interested to hear everyone else's thoughts. If you haven't read it, are you interested or what's holding you back? So until next time, I'm Jonathan, and thank you for watching.